Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We have truly been blessed this morning. Amen. Amen. God has been good to us, continues to be good to us, and his presence has been felt here this morning. Eddie, man, I'm going to miss you. Church, can we say that we're going to miss the Lopez family? We're going to miss the Lopez family. But God is awesome. He continues to bless. And um, I'm glad that uh, I've had this opportunity. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here this morning. And um, we'll get started at this time. So in the past few weeks, we have been truly blessed with some awesome messages of um, hope and encouragement. And I just wanted to reflect on a few of those messages and how it ties in to the message of the king, the gospel of the kingdom of God. In Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus said this, he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The first message that I wanted to reflect on was a greater love. Then we had the gospel according to cats. Blind faith versus true revival, a tale of two messiahs. And then last week, we had one entitled, Obedience Matters. And at first glance, these topics might seem different as night and day. But I think that each of them tells a unique part of the grand narrative as it relates to the gospel of the kingdom of God. A greater love pointed us to the unfathomable love of God that cast out fears and invites us into a deeper relationship with him. This love is greater than our fears, greater than our doubts, and greater than anything we face. Then there was the gospel according to cats. This one might have reminded us of the unexpected places and ways we see God's message of love and grace. Even in the simplest of things, teaching us about trust in the unexpected. Blind faith versus true revival, a tale of two messiahs. This one challenged us to differentiate between following Christ out of habit or fear and embracing a genuine, heartfelt revival rooted in true faith and trust in Him as it relates to prophecy. And lastly, obedience matters. That one reminded us that our faith in God is demonstrated by our obedience to His Word, trusting in His promises and letting go of fears that hold us back. When we bring all these threads together, we see the gospel, the gospel's call to trust and obey God in all circumstances. In facing fear and trusting God, hopefully we will find that the gospel of the kingdom of God isn't just a message of salvation, but a call to trust God wholeheartedly even when our fears loom large. So today, as we dive into what it means to face fears and trust in God, remember that the gospel is our guide. Whether it is through the lessons we learn from a cat, the revelation of a greater love, the discernment of true faith, or the call to obedience, the gospel of the kingdom of God invites us all to trust in God, the God who is with us every step, leading us to his perfect peace. 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, it's at this time your words are going to be going forth to the ears and the hearts of your people. Lord, who am I and what am I that I should be the one to impart your words of life to your people? At this time, we are asking and praying and pleading for the presence of the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts to receive of thee what you have in store for each and every one of us. Father in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful for your love, for your mercy, and your continued care and guidance in our lives. Help us, Lord, to allow this message of hope and encouragement to minister to us according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our text for this morning comes to us from 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 1 John 4, 18. And I thought we would just kind of reflect on them. Again, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. This quote comes to us from Steps to Christ, and Sister White says this. She says, when we take into our hands the management of things with which we have to do and depend upon our own wisdom for success, we are taking upon ourselves the responsibility that belongs to God. And thus, we are really putting ourselves in his place. We may well have anxiety and anticipate danger and loss, for it is certain to befall us. But when we really believe that God loves us and means to do us good, we shall cease to worry about the future. So there are two takeaways that I'd like to share with you at this, one, this morning. The first one is our tendency to take control of our lives relying on our own wisdom and strength, which often leads to anxiety and fear because we are not equipped to handle these burdens without God's help. The second point, when we depend on our own wisdom for success, we exclude God's guidance and aid. This act of self-reliance places us in God's position leading to inevitable worry and fear of failure. And so our theme this morning is our journey through life is often marked by moments of uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. Yet, as followers of Christ, we are called to navigate these challenges with a spirit of trust and faith in God. A.L. Kirkpatrick tells the following story. A backwoods farmer sitting on the steps of a tumble-down shack was approached by a stranger who stopped for a drink of water. How is your wheat coming along? asked the stranger. Didn't plant none. Really? I thought this was good wheat country. Afraid it would rain. Well, how about your corn crop? Ain't got none afraid of corn blight. The stranger, confused but persevering, continued, well, sir, how about your potatoes? Didn't plant no potatoes either, afraid of potato bugs. For Pete's sake, man, the stranger asked, what did you plant? Nothing, said the farmer. I just played it safe. Fear kept him from taking risks, and as a result, he lost out. So what are Americans afraid of? 
National research by R.H. Bruskin's Associates shows the following hierarchy of fear. So the first one, glossophobia, or fear of public speaking. This one topped the list at 40.6% of those interviewed. This fear is greater among women than men and the greatest in the southern United States. The next one, acrophobia, or fear of high places. This one came in at 32%. This one was, it's followed by entomophobia. I have to say that one really slow. Entomophobia, or fear of insects and bugs. Three times as many women as men in this group. Chromatophobia, fear of financial problems, came next. Thalassophobia, fear of deep water. Nosophobia, fear of sickness. Aerophobia, fear of flying. And then autophobia, fear of loneliness. It is safe to say that fear is rampant in this country and the world at large and at every level of man's living. In addition to those previously mentioned, there is fear of the future, fear of the present, fear of war, fear of being found out, fear of being attacked, fear of non-acceptance or rejection, fear of death, fear of persecution, fear of failure within or without. These numerous fears have gripped many lives. Fear is the single greatest emotion influencing us. The common symptoms in 90% of chronic patients is fear. Their trouble did not start with a cough or chest pain, but with fear. It is a powerful emotion that Satan makes use of to keep people, but especially more so God's people, bound. So what is fear? Merriam-Webster Dictionary defined fear as an unpleasant, often strong emotion that caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. Fear does not exist in isolation. It is a response to a danger. If we are scared of something, it cannot be in the abstract, even if we cannot say precisely what that something is. George Bernard Shaw speculated that fear is one universal passion of humankind. In one form or another, we all struggle at times with the powerful fears that paralyzed us and that throw us into a mental tension or depression or prompt us to hastily act in panic. In the history of mankind, the very first man and woman, woman experienced fear. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Adam and Eve had never before known what it was to be afraid until they sinned. Before they sinned, they lived in harmony with God and with the rest of the created order. So it is safe to say that craven or cowardly fear was the result of sin and has become a powerful tool in Satan's arsenal, as mentioned previous, to keep men and women bound. The devil's strategy. How does he do this? Well, one way is through lies 
or false evidence that appear real. Right? When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said, There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Multiple fears begin with lies that Satan has told us. He tries to handicap us with fear because he knows that the truth will both set and make us free. Then Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen? Amen. As the deceiver, Satan uses the natural emotion of fear against us to make us feel helpless in resisting him. He holds up a magnifying glass to make things appear larger than they may actually be. Why? Because he wants us to doubt the Lord and ourselves because it makes him appear stronger than he really is. He discredits God in every way he can, whispering lying accusations to us about God as he did to Adam and Eve. If we allow the enemy to deceive us with lies, we do not submit our fears to the fear of God. We can and will be open to the spirit of fear, one that intimidates and keeps us from being bold and courageous. Fears, fear's innate ability. Fear has the ability to paralyze the child of God. According to Webster's dictionary, Paralysis is a complete or partial loss of power to feel or move. This is what fear does to the Christian. The tentacles of fear embraces his heart and renders him powerless to move or act in obedience to God's word. The late President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes the needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. God does not want his people to retreat. He wants them to advance. In our text for this morning, he assures us that he has not given us this spirit of fear. Fear versus faith. Fear is linked with the lack of faith and the fear of the Lord. When we are afraid, we are not trusting God. Again, let us rem be reminded that fear is one of the main weapons that the enemy uses to torment us and to di dictate feelings and behavior to us. In Testimonies to the Church, Sister White states the following. Why should we be ungrateful and distrustful? Jesus is our friend. All heaven is interested in our welfare, and our anxiety and fear grieves the Holy Spirit of God. God wants to deliver everyone who struggles with fear. When God's people are free from fear, then they can walk in power, authority, and victory. Amen? Amen? I am reminded of the story of David and Goliath found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The whole nation of Israel, including King Saul, was shaken to the core by the rumblings of the Philistine giant. Fear had locked them in a place of defeat. Then came the little shepherd boy, David. He wouldn't let any Philistine giant threaten him. It took a little lad full of faith to fell the enemy. Remember David's words? Thou comest to me with sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David knew what fear's enemy is. The enemy of fear is faith. David confronted the enemy. 
he chose not to run. He stared that enemy in the face and stood on the authority of God's word and covenant with Israel. David's confidence was in the faithfulness and power of the God he knew so well. David made a good confession when he said, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Let us not forget the battle is not ours, but the Lord's. And he has yet to lose a battle. Amen? Amen. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? In our text for today, we see Paul addressing Timothy about the spirit of fear. In Timothy's case, the fear was for the unknown future that did not include Paul helping him in ministry. Paul wrote this letter shortly before his execution. Timothy, no doubt, was fearful of losing his father in the faith. He was afraid of ending up in, in a prison similar to Paul and afraid of receiving the same sentence of death as Paul. Timothy felt as if he had much to fear. But, God, but Paul invites a rights to Timothy, speaking the truth in love, to tell him that the fear he was experiences, experiencing is not from God, therefore it must be resisted. Paul encouraged Timothy to resist fear and take courage. So we too need to resist fear and take courage. The dictionary defines courage this way. Mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. God said to Joshua in Joshua 1.9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. For the third time, God repeats this precept to Joshua that he is to have courage and not be afraid. Why? Because he, God, he, God was with him wherever he went, and whatever he had to face. We, God's people, have this same assurance, the assurance of his continued pre presence wherever we go, whatever we fear, uh, face. So we need not fear, but take courage. It is said that in the King James Version of the Bible, fear not, is mentioned 365 times. That means that there is one fear not for every single day of the year. Amen? Let us consider four principles of dealing with fear. Like David and Joshua, these four principles will help us move from fear to faith, from cowardice, to courage. First principle, remember your position. This first step, it, uh, the first step is to take courage, to remember who you are in Jesus Christ. Remember that in Christ you are strong, you are victorious, you are accepted, you are justified, you are redeemed. You are saved. You are completely forgiven. Your sins and mine are washed away. We are seated with Jesus in the heavenlies. We are justified. Therefore, we are righteous. We are born for courage, not for fear. Our scripture reading states, God gave us not a spirit of faith, fearfulness, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So therefore, if we have a spirit of fear, timidity, or anxiety, it did not come from God. 
For God does not give his people a spirit of fear. Principle number two, control your confront, confront your fear. Proverbs 28, 1 states, The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You will be gripped with fear until you decide to confront it. Fear will win every day until we stand up, look that fear straight in the face, and say, you are not going to win over me anymore. With the help of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I am going to win against you. Brothers and sisters, we will never win until we rise up and confront the thing that is dragging us down. Again, courage is nothing more than seeing the fear and taking action against it. How many of you are acquainted with the 95% rule of worry? This rule simply states that 95% of the things you worry about won't happen. In other words, you're worrying about something that may never happen. And even if it does happen, deal with it when it happens. Amen? God has given us a sound mind so that we can look at our problems. He has given us power so we can overcome. And he has given us love so we can respond in his character. There is no reason for a child of God to be gripped or destroyed by fear. Technical difficulties. <laughs> the third principle, the third principle is censor your input. A healthy mind is absolutely essential to getting free from fear. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That comes to us from Proverbs 23, verse 7. There is a negative side and a positive side to this. The negative side is that you have to cut the negative people out of your life. Those who are dragging you down. You probably have people telling you that you can't. It can't be done. It won't work. They tell kids, you, can't, you can study all you want, you can work as hard as you want, you still won't make an A. You can save all the money you want, you still won't buy that house. You can apply for that job, but you will never make it. They are just a bunch of cans and ain'ts and naysayers who pull you down and feed your fears. Censor your input so you're not listening to people who are feeding your fears. The positive side is the Word of God. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Colossians 3, 2 tells us to set our minds on things above where Christ dwells with God in heaven. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they which love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. 
This will work for us, but we have to make it work. It takes effort and determination. Put the word of God in one ear, and fear will go out the other ear. Fill your mind with the word of God, and you won't have time to dwell in the depths of overcoming fear. We have to censor our input in a time of crisis so the Word of God becomes not just something we read, but literally the stuff we live on. Fourth principle, cultivate love. We have to live in such a way as if fear didn't exist. 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. We can either have the love of God or we can have fear generated by Satan, but we can't have them both dominating our life at the same time. Either fear will push the love out or the love of God will push the fear out. Fear is the opposite of boldness and should have no place in the mind of the Christian. Commenting on this verse, A.E. Brooks says, Fear, which is essentially self-centered, has no place in love, which in its perfection involves complete self-surrender. The two cannot exist side by side. On the other hand, perfect love, which centers on God, cannot tolerate slavish fear and does not need to, for if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. He who truly loves has no fear of God and has no need to fear the machinations or evil schemes of men. The more we grow in love, the less we fear. When our love is perfectly developed and free from all traces of self, we shall be without cowardly fear of God or man. We shall not fear God because we know he is love. We shall not fear man because we know that our loving friend will not allow anything to come upon us that will not be for our ultimate good and that he will, and that he will be with us where whenever our path leads through trial or danger. Friends, it is time to face the giants in our lives. Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength and courage and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I lived through this horror, I can take the next thing that comes along. Confront those fears, which is the enemy. Don't run. When trouble comes, don't get so consumed with the problem that you forget the great things God has performed in the past. In her book, Life Sketches of Ellen G. White, Sister White stated the following, We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Remember, he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Let your past victories build our faith. Remember your position. When we are in the heart, the heat of battle, when we are in the heat of battle, God fights for us. And if he be for you, who can be against you? And who is there who can stand against the might of our God? He is mighty to save. Zephaniah stated this in Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty he will save. Amen. Don't 
do not look at the temporal circumstances. Instead, look to the God of those circumstances. Accept the good report and not the evil report. Remember to censor the input. Don't get locked into your current condition. God wants us to be free from fear. Put your faith to work. Resist the devil with the promises of God and the spirit of fear will flee. Sister White's quote and 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 7 collectively remind us that facing fear and trusting God involves recognizing our limitations and God's infinite power and love. By relinquishing control and trusting in His wisdom, we embrace the spirit of power, love, and the sound mind that God has given us. This trust dispels fear, allowing us to live with confidence and peace in God's faithful care. May we all learn to trust God more deeply, allowing His perfect love to cast out fear and his power to guide us through every challenge. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to ask the songsters, the singers, to come forward. And we're going to sing a closing hymn. I think it's 618, right? Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. And while they're making their way up front, I would like to close out this, today's message with this following, this poem. Its title is, When I Am Afraid. When I'm afraid of times before, what coming days will bring, when life's omission I deplore and earth mists, mists round me cling, O Lord of love, my weakness see, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in Thee. When I'm afraid of dangers near, foreboding future ills, when rocks and shoals and deeps I fear and gloom my spirit fills, O Lord of might, my weakness see, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in thee. When I'm afraid of crushing loss, parting from loved one dear, lest I shall murmur at my cross and yield to faithless fear, O Lord of peace, my weakness see, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in thee. When I'm afraid of failing health, sore weaknesses I know, and illness steal o'er me by stealth, and sickness lays me low, O Lord of power, my weakness see. When I'm afraid, I'll trust in thee. When I'm afraid of dear old age, as nature's power decay, mortality's dread heritage, Increasing day by day, O Lord of grace, my weakness see, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in thee. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and grateful for your continued blessings and presence in our life and that you've given us assurance that we fear not for you are with us. We need not be dismayed for you are our God and you make perfect your strength in our weakness. We give you thanks and praise for knowing that you love us so very much that you spared nothing to see that we have a way of escape. As we walk, Lord, through the valley of the shadow of death, help us, Lord, instead of fearing the circumstances, focusing on the circumstancing, looking at our circumstances. Instead, help us to look at the, to the God of our circumstances, the one who has all the answers, the one who has never lost a battle, the one who is perfectly able to deliver us from every and anything that we may face in our life's journey. We ask your blessing upon each and every person that's represented here this morning. Lord, teach us how to face fear while trusting you. Let our faith and our trust be in you, your ability to deliver and to set us free. And so we give you thanks and praise, knowing that you are God, and besides you there is none other. And so, Lord, teach us how to be still and allow you to be God, the God of our lives, the God who wants to see us safe and saved into your kingdom of grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.